again. This is the third in a series of uh, videos, short videos, on finite element analysis. In the first video, I talked a little bit about just the big idea. What is finite element analysis? Where does it come from? And why is it so stinking handy? The second video, I talked a little bit about matrix uh, notation, how to write down structural problems in terms of matrices, and ran through a very simple statics problem. Well, we've got the background now, so we can now do a very simple finite element problem. And I want to start simple. If you can't do the simple ones, it's going to be hard to do the complex ones. So I'm, I've got what I think is the simplest finite element problem I can imagine. If there's a simpler one, I'm not sure I know how to do it, at least a simpler one that actually means anything. Um, so I'll show you that here in a second. But let's talk about, uh, real quick, what kind of finite elements we need, okay? So let's, let's pretend we've got a 2D truss. Okay, a pin jointed truss that looks like this. And these big circles I've got here indicate those are those are pin joints. The, the, the beams are only pinned together. They're not welded together, they're not fixed. So there can't be any moments at the end. And the reason it stands up is because there's triangles everywhere. It's it's uh, it's the, the stiffness is finite, the stiffness isn't zero anywhere. So this will actually support a load that I've got there as F. Right? So if I'm going to build this mathematically or physically, I need, to, I need to have some elements to work with. Well, let's say this is a real physical truss. Let's say I've made one of these out of aluminum or steel or something. And I pull all the pins out, pull all those five pins out, and I start laying the, the bars down next to each other. Okay? Let's say I have all five of them laid out, and this is one of them, and they're parallel to each other and that's the x direction. Okay. What I've got here is a bar with two uh, hinges basically on the end and let's see, I'll call that uh, point one and that point two. All right. Well since these are hinges, there's no way to get a force into this bar any other way than along the axis of the bar. There's no such thing as a force this way as long as it's assembled that way. As long as it's pin jointed, the forces in the truss element have to go along the axis of the element. So, I can have a force at point one, and I can have a force at point two. That's pretty much everything I need to know to describe that bar, except for, well, it would be help if I had an elastic modulus. It would be good to know that. And since the uh, displacement, change in length of a bar, is F L over A E, helps to know uh, what the length is. I'll need to know that. And I'll need to know the cross-sectional area A. F comes later, all right? Well, that, I'll show you where that comes from here in a minute. So let's say I know E and A. I guess I'll make that a capital A. Try that again. I'll make a capital A. So let's say I know all that stuff for every truss element. In theory, I ought to be able to analyze what's going on here, and that's right. Now, this thing right here is the building block of that truss. It, there's also a mathematical building block called a finite element, and this thing is going to be called a bar element. And it's important to know the lingo here because there are different kinds of elements built into finite element programs. They actually have something they call a finite element library. And this is a list of the elements that are built into the software that you can use in order to assemble a structure. And there are uh, elements that have different properties. You'll see bar elements like this. These are the simplest ones, the ones we're going to talk about right now. There are beam elements that really can have bending. They, they, they can have moments at the end that this can't have. But they're still essentially one-dimensional. There are uh, membrane elements that are two-dimensional only. They're assumed to have essentially zero thickness. They have shear and in-plane strength only, and they don't have any uh, bending strength. That's a membrane element. And there, the next step up from that is a plate element that's planar, but it's got thickness and it's got bending stiffness now. Okay? And other elements include, there's rectangular brick elements that represent just a rectangular brick of material, whatever the material is. There's tetrahedral elements that look like a pyramid. Those are um, made out of solid material. And it goes out from there. There are fluid elements and there are uh, electromagnetic elements. There's all kinds of elements out there. And those are all built into 
your finite element library that's built into whatever finite element program you're using, you get to assemble those. That's, that's, what, that's what's in the Lego bucket. If you want to make something out of Legos, you have all these different blocks you get to work with to make your castle or your ship or your dragon or whatever it is you're building. And mathematically speaking, we have a finite element library. That's analogous to your bucket full of Legos. You get to pull stuff out of that to make something complicated out of it. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you where a bar element comes from. In order to do it, actually, I'm going to show you, I'm going to write down the problem first. And by the time I get done talking about that, I should be at about eh, nine, ten minutes. I'll stop and I'll do the, the second video in this series in the next clip, okay? So let's make a really, really simple uh, truss problem. In fact, it doesn't even really look like a truss, but it is, technically speaking. Let's do this. Let's say I've got two bars here, and they fit together this way. Make sure that's the longer of the two. There we go. And it's only these two two bars are parallel to each other. They're in line with each other. Now to keep them that way, I need something physical to hold them up. So let's say there's a little roller, like a roller skate or a skateboard or something, under there to hold them in place, so they can't buckle and they can't move outside that line. And let's say I have a force acting in that direction, and that's twenty thousand newtons. Okay. Let's put some more numbers on this. E for both of them is 70 gigapascals, which is 70 times 10 to the ninth pascals, and pascals are newton per meter squared. So that's, if you might recognize that, that's the elastic modulus of aluminum. And we're going to assume those two bars are made out of aluminum. I need a cross-sectional area. So let's say uh, A is 100 millimeters squared. Okay, that's, that's a decent size for this. And I need some lengths. Let's say that length right there is one meter. I'm sorry, that one's, I knew I was going to get this wrong. That's 0 0.7 meters there, and that's one meter there. Now I got it right. Okay, so there you go. There's the geometry. Now, when I say I want to analyze this, what I really mean is, given all this stuff right here, I want to find a displacement. Well, which displacement? In order to know that, I've actually got to do a little bit of bookkeeping here. I've got to start numbering some things. Let's number the grid points first. That'll be grid point number one, and that'll be grid point number two, and that'll be grid point number three. I'm saying grid point. A grid point is a joint in this structure, and the reason I call it a grid point is if you actually go into the bulk data file, or the, the file in your finite element uh, model that is the actual commands that are used to define the finite element model. In the codes I've worked with, and I assume most of them, there is a line in that file that has the word grid, G-R-I-D, and usually three numbers after that. And that. What that's telling the program is here's a joint, here's a place where elements will join to each other, because they really only join to each other at grid points, and those three numbers are the X, Y, and Z locations. Okay, so that's that's why I'm, I'm, from now on I'm going to call those grid points, because that's what finite element lingo says. Next thing I need to know is I need to know element numbers. Well, let's, let's, I got a number of those two, so I'm going to call that element one, and this down here element two, which is just for symmetry. Let me put this down here, I guess. All right, now, you can see that there's some, some potential for confusion here. What I want to do is the grid points are going to have a number with a circle around them, because it looks kind of like a, a hint or a, a pin joint or a, a point. And the element numbers are going to have a line under them, because that you know, looks kind of like a line. I guess that's a good enough way to sort this out. So we know that there's no deflection at 1. So we know x1 is going to be 0. We know x3 is going to be 0. Let's find x2. Okay, That's the only point here that can actually move. Now. Think about this for a second in terms of statics and strength of materials. There are two elements here, so there's two forces that are going to act on that point right there. There's the force from element one and the force from element two. There's two things I need to know, two unknowns. However, there's only one equation of equilibrium you can write. There's no forces, there's nothing going on in the y direction, so all, you can only sum the forces in the x direction. All right, that means two unknowns, one equation. This is statically indeterminate. You cannot solve this with statics. You have to use strength of materials. Well, I did a video a while back on statically indeterminate problems, and you can certainly do this without finite elements, but 
this is a, let, let's use this as a way to learn something about finite elements. We have to use elasticity. We have to use the fact that the uh, elastic modulus isn't infinity now and that there will be a deflection there. So I'm going to stop here since I'm about 10 minutes in. And the next in a clip, the two of two here, I'm going to tell you how to solve this problem using finite elements and how to make that uh, element, the mathematical description of a bar element.